since we started from from day one till now, we've done over about four hundred twenty odd thousand downloads just from wow. the podcast, and it's just been consistently growing. And every month, we've gone from forty to fifty downloads, and so like forty thousand to fifty thousand downloads. So it's been doing really well. You know, I'm very very happy that. There's so, so much traction and built a really strong community behind it and a lot of loyal listeners. It's, it's quite a lot of man hours actually, you now you think about it. And then all the publishing and editing, maybe another hour on top. So all up, maybe about seven hours per episode from, from that side of the business. We stand today. The Business Method the business with method. a shout The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars and annual revenue and now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results economies and cultures there's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method from toilet deodorizing to having a top-ranking real estate podcast on iTunes, Tyrone Shum, the founder of Property Investory and Property Investory Podcast, is joining us today. Tyrone started his podcast a little over a year ago when realizing there was a need in Australia for some better and more frequent real estate podcast. He launched a show and over 12 months grew it to where he's getting 40,000 downloads per month. Today, we dive into the nitty-gritty of podcasting. Tyrone shares the specific details on how he grew his podcast rapidly rapidly the importance of iTunes stats and iTunes reviews and a few little hacks that he uses to publish daily and get ranked faster. It's an incredible episode guys and without further ado, Tyrone Shum. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools and tactics. And listeners, I'm incredibly excited to welcome Tyrone Shum to the show all the way from Sydney, Australia. You're the third Tyrone, believe it or not, you're the third uh, interview from Sydney we have done this week, and I want to say welcome to the show. Awesome! Well, thank you so much, Chris. It's been a, it's a pleasure to be actually coming onto your show. Are you a native Australian? Uh, yes, I was born in Australia, and uh -huh. uh, born yeah born and bred in Australia. My parents and family are originally from Hong Kong and China, actually. So I'm kind of considered first generation Chinese here in Australia, or first generation Australia, I should say. Very cool. Now I've got to tell you this funny story. Your email is ts at da -da 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 dot com. You can share it later if you want. And mm -hmm. and while I was setting up this interview with you, um, I got an email from uh, ts at, let's see what it is, ts at, it's like camaraderie dot com or something like that. And I thought it was you. <laughs> And okay. it was, I sent out an email blast earlier this week saying high performance entrepreneurs and beating Tony Robbins on iTunes. And what I, what I talked about is uh, a little bit about Elon Musk in the newsletter. Mm -hmm. And I got this reply from TS at, uh, blah, 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 com. But I found out now it was not you. It says, Chris, this is in all sincerity. I'm not trying a, a message of assistance. I'm not trying to be a jerk. Advice, drop the Elon Musk worship like yesterday. This guy is a complete fraud and it will soon be apparent even if the flabbiest, game-addicted, pre-diabetic, soy-drinking, testosterone-challenged, social justice warrior millennials. Yes, even this crowd will finally figure out that when, that when the MSM is forced to report an impending bankruptcy on Tesla and how SpaceX is going to be a complete fraud built on CGI, mark these words and when it all goes down, remember this email, okay? Cheers, TS. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like, this guy. I'm setting an interview up with this guy right now. Why would he 
send an email to me like that, even if he does believe, you know, has never met me. And I still can't, can't figure it out. So I'm glad to know it's not you. <laughs> yes, I'm glad too. <laughs> I, I personally would not send anything like that. And I'm not usually that controversial. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's definitely not me. <laughs> it blew me away. I've never received an email that was just so like Frank, like, you know, oh, but anyway, yeah. Maybe he was, uh, yeah, had a lot to say and maybe had a bad day. So <laughs> Yes. I, when something like that happens, you know, and I think somebody's having a bad day, I just always say, oh, I think their grandma died this week or something. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing to laugh about, but yeah, I no. know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Or their dog died, you know. Yes. Uh, um, so welcome to the show, man. I've heard great things about you. I was introduced via uh, James Schramko, uh, which is, a, I think, a mutual friend of both of ours. And he, he said great things about you. And then I listened to the podcast that you had uh, with him. And I was like, oh, man, that, that guy sounds amazing. And so, but first I have to ask you, before we dive into the, the nitty gritty, like you're a successful entrepreneur, you have a successful podcast, successful YouTube channel too. Um, you, you. you but, but back in the day, you had a toilet deodorizing business. Is this true? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that always makes me laugh because I think back and I'm like, gosh, that was a bit embarrassing to actually <laughs> delve into. Yeah, we, we well, I, I, I actually, my wife stumbled across that and, you know, I'll give all credit to her. You know, it's her idea. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not she likes it or not, it's, it's her story. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we're looking for a product overseas to import because we we're actually doing quite successful with an import based business. I was actually importing. Dragon Boat Paddles. I don't know if you know heard the sport Dragon Boat. It's very, very popular in Canada and very popular in huh. parts of the United States. And um, I, there, wasn't very, um, there wasn't a market here initially to um, sell paddles, but then it turned into that when I was actually you know, competing nationally and, and quite competitive in that sport and started importing all these Dragon Boat Paddles because all across Australia, people were just ordering through me. And I guess maybe because I was probably one of maybe three suppliers in Australia they had to come to me the border and we we're just doing quite a big volume through there like easily six figures and we said all right well we're pretty successful at doing this and i sold that business and i thought why don't we find something similar in terms of a product distribution like import a product and then sell it using the same systems mm -hmm. and basically my wife said look there's always an embarrassing moment you know every time you go to the toilet you go find something to cover that odor so why not find something that's a little discreet and people don't have to smell that spray of deodorizer <laughs> when you why don't we just find this little deodorizer you just drop one drop and then it'll, it'll you know release the it, like master smell and um that's how we came across that and had to go a lot of press release over in canada and speech and tv shows and radio appearances and so forth and i thought no one's doing it in australia so we we signed a contract with them to import it from there um exclusively to australia um, yeah, interesting story about that. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, timing wasn't the best because the exchange rate pretty much went from oh. I think seventy cents down to like fifty cents, so it killed all our margin. Unfortunately, oh, no. that business yeah uh, failed because of that. And um, I guess we we got ourselves a, a whole bunch or almost a pallet full of euros which we could use for years on end. So <laughs> there was a benefit out of that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a funny story. That's great. Well, we want to learn more about you before we dive into uh, our main topic today. Are you are you the the co-founder of PropertyInvestory.com? Is that correct, or the full I'm, founder? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm the full founder. Gotcha. Founder of Property Investory. I'm the host of of the whole podcast. We bring on lots and lots of experts, Australian property experts, onto the show. People who have multi million dollar portfolios. People with developers like three four hundred million dollar developments going on. Just to 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 really find out how they built their businesses or built their property investment portfolios and share their stories behind it and the why and drive a lot of motivation to, to our listeners. So yeah, that's basically the podcast. I'm curious, were you uh, doing any real estate before you started the, the podcast and the business? Well, many years ago, yes. Probably over a decade, I was a real estate agent for three and a half years. And that was straight after I finished university. I went straight into property or real estate business to sell property to vendors. Did that for about three and a half years and then just um, took a turn back into digital marketing because that's where I was running businesses such as the Dragon Boat business and Deodorizer and, and digital agency. And that was where I, I pursued sort of pretty much for the last 10 years. And then I was like, mm, I really miss property and I love property because that's what I initially started. So that's where I was like searching, listening to lots of different podcasts about property 
and really, really keen to actually find out more. There was a bit of a problem though because I was listening to so many and, and I got through them one very quickly because I was listening to them in double time. So I could really go through a whole series or whole um, whole show within probably a week or two and I was like running a podcast to listen to or episodes on property. And then secondly as well, a lot of the stories, sorry, a lot of the episodes were just the how-to and then nuts and bolts and, and details about how to invest into property. And what was missing from that element was the story behind why people were doing it. Because when people tell you a story, I seem to remember the details behind the story more than the nitty-gritty details of how much they own. Mm -hmm. And I think that was something that just kind of kind of um, struck at me and said, look, you know, I want to find more about why these people are doing it. Because that's when I can actually resonate and also um, align where people are going. And that way I can sort of follow a similar journey. And when I... When I discovered that there wasn't, I thought, oh, I might as well, you know, scratch my itch. But <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what happened was it took me about a year to make that decision because I was like really hesitant. I'm thinking, oh, there's a lot of work involved creating a podcast. I don't know if I'll be able to find the right guests. All those kind of fears that came in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then I just said, all right, screw this. Just get started. <laughs> and then, you know, I've never turned back. So it's been one of the best things I've ever done. Back in the day, one of my very first entrepreneurial ventures was – working with a um, network, uh, a real estate network marketing company and real estate education. And we had this $20,000 package that we would make 50% profit on or commissions on. And it was called Nouveau Riche. And there was like 25,000 members. And this was, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, before the crash. And we would go and we would sell these packages, make 10 grand or whatever, and then partner up and then go the, do these real estate investments. It was a great idea in a great system, other than the fact that the majority of the people that were signing up for the packages were getting their money through credits. And then when a recession hit, because I was in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, um, Southern California area, when the recession hit uh, in 2008, Boom, that just that nobody could, you know, there was no longer any income because the credit sources dried up and um, people couldn't afford the packages. And so our business went tanked, tanked, tanked. Ooh. But it, that was my first journey into the real estate world. I enjoyed it. Um, it was a wild ride and it was a lot of fun and great experience. But, you know, it was just a, a funny thing. And then they say the founders started stealing money from the business at the end of it. But I've been a bit in the real estate world. I think it's amazing. Um, and I think it's uh, one way to, to massively grow wealth over the long yes. term. I'm curious, if, is that kind of your long term goal, too, with this podcast, learning more about real estate so you can grow your wealth? Yes, absolutely. So the whole intention was one to meet a lot of great people who have already successfully done it because I think the best way to learn is to see who has already done it in the past. There's no point reinventing, reinventing the wheel and try and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Learn from the people who have successfully laid down the path and there's been millions and millions of people who have successfully you know, made money through property and also too to connect with those people where you can actually um, gain some potential contacts which would might be able to help you along the journey too, you know, such as mortgage brokers or people like um, real estate agents or buyers agents or you know pretty much anyone who you might need during that journey of actually investing into property and um, at the same time I've gained a lot of great contacts but also too a lot of them have shared with me some amazing information and even give me access to their courses so I'm really grateful for and um, they've been helping me along my journey to lead into that which I've been spending a lot of time in the uh, property development arena so yeah I've really really been very fortunate to do that and I, I didn't know where this would take me so many great opportunities until now could you sh share one golden nugget that you've learned from having access to these real estate courses that that kind of has shaken you up a bit or given you an aha moment on something that you may act on yeah well the thing is when I first started looking at property investing and I, I've read so many stories and even one of my um, closer friends who I, I actually did a bit of work with previously and, and um, knew through another contact and so forth. He started off with um, basically full-time work and, and was just dabbling in property and, and bought a few. And within a very short space of about three and a half years, he built up to buying 20 properties in Australia. Mm. Now, 
that is substantial for a very young person. He's just turned 30 odd years old mm. and so the portfolio is worth millions and millions of dollars. And to do something like that takes a lot of tenacity, persistence, but also a lot of time as well. And what really fascinated about him was he inspired me to go into buying property as well. You know, he's probably one of the starts because I was like, wow. If he can do it, you know, he's much younger than I am, Why, what's stopping me from doing it? So I guess I, I, I took that part as being an inspiration to drive into it. And then over the time that I've interviewed so many experts and so many investors, I've seen so many different strategies and it gives me a choice to pick which one would be suitable for my, one, uh, risk appetite and two, for my personality because I, everyone's different. Some people might be happy to just buy and hold a property and then just let it sit there are other people who want to add value and, and do more active type of investing. And then there's other people who want to be more like passive, you know, where they just have this massive portfolio and then just live off it. So I guess I, I sort of saw so many different ways to do it. And one thing that struck me the most was um, property development, which if you look back at history, a lot of people who have made a tremendous amount of wealth are usually the property developers, people who come in, create brand new housing for for a demand in the market and usually are able to um, sell off, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of that to be able to generate their wealth and usually hold you know, a lot of those properties as well for their future wealth as well. So for me, I think one of the aha moments has been to consider and move into property development as being one of my strategies because I actually never thought about that until more recently when I actually interviewed a numerous or number of property developers. Now, your podcast, Property Investory, uh, has done really well for itself, and congratulations on that. How how long? How old is the podcast now? It would be sitting on just a little bit over twelve months. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> when we first started, and I, I'd like to know a little bit about the timeline. So, well, first, listeners, go to Property Investory on iTunes, subscribe and listen, and leave a nice review if you enjoy Tyrone's podcast. But I'd like to learn about your timeline over the past year, some of the things you did to make it grow, um, some of the things you were surprised about, but just a bit of the history of the podcast and, and, and growing it over the past 12 months. Sure. Okay, well, let's start from the beginning. Uh, when I first started the Property Investory podcast, um, I made sure that I had at least 10 interviews, 10 to 12, I think, for memory interviews already lined up. And because my goal was to release it daily, which was a big ask, I thought to myself, gosh, you know, I want to try and do something a bit different to what the other um, podcasters were doing. I made sure I had plenty in the in the um, like backlog, as you can say. So I had 10 that was ready, and then I was I had already, I think, 50 interviews already done. So basically, we just were continuously editing. And the thing is, I didn't do this all myself. I have to credit my team that's helped me. So I hired a number of interns who helped me write and also a, a few digital interns who helped me um, upload and you know do all that back-end admin type of stuff. I mostly focus on doing the interviews and when I have the interview, I just send it off to them to do all that and then I, I basically go through and do the editing. And if you listen to my podcast, it's not just a usual interview and it's not just the usual you know, um, straight cut because you think, oh yeah, you can just do an interview and then upload it straight away and publish it. It's not that easy for us because we add a lot of different things to it. For one, we go through and edit the whole script, so we cut out any of the um, <clears throat> any of sort of the, the, the questions that I ask the guests. We, we cut out a lot of the, the chit-chat because there'll be a lot of times where you just chit-chat about, you know, what's happening in your life, that, 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 that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And we make it very much of a sort of succinct, tight story. So if anyone's heard of maybe how I built this podcast or Freakonomics podcast, it's very similar to that, and that's where I got the inspiration from, and I give total credit to these guys who create them. So we, we go through and we edit the whole podcast and ensure that we cut out all the questions and put narrations, put background music, and so forth. So that way, when you hear the whole episode, it's actually a fully professional edited um, uh, episode so people can actually enjoy that listening. And that's the reason why I think a lot of people enjoy it is because it's an easy-to-listen type of um, podcast. So that way, you're not listening to just an interview straight without anything, um, yeah, giving it sort of any climax or down and so forth. So I guess I've, I've come from that kind of story background where I used to do video, I used to do a lot of scripting and stuff like that. And because of that experience, I was able to tie that back into podcasting. So 
that is the first thing just to sort of listeners to really know and that's the reason why this podcast is taken off is because it's great content you know i have to say so myself <laughs> uh, what it is though when i first started i was like mm, i'll try and get maybe you know a few hundred listeners to try and listen to it so i got my mom my dad my you know dog and everyone who i knew to try and leave a review on itunes and also help me download uh, when I first released it, I had pretty much maybe 10, 15 downloads and it was absolutely nothing compared to what it was now. But the strategy I, I learned from a lot of other successful podcasters was to actually ask the guests who had been on the show to uh, share it with their audience and share it with their networks and see if we can try and get some downloads that way. And that's what they kind of did, but it didn't happen all at once. That's the thing because you kind of were hoping if you asked 12 of them, you'd expect 12 to respond and they all responded saying, yeah, I'll help you. But realistically, maybe two or three of them actually broadcasted out. And, yeah. You know, that sort of started off really slow. In the first week or so, I probably got maybe, a, you know, maybe 10, 15 downloads and it was just like, oh gosh, put all that effort in. I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, and, and, and it was a very, very slow start, I have to admit. And I think over the weeks and months and stuff, I just persisted and constantly just sent out, you know, emails to the guest Lynn and the show was, or the episode was live. And, and gradually start seeing numbers go up because they'd start sharing. You know, you get maybe 100 here, 100 there, you know, 300 here, et cetera. And once you start seeing that pattern go through, then you get loyal listeners who start to subscribe. And then before you know it, over a period of, say, 12 months now, we're averaging anywhere between 1,500 to 2,000 um, listeners per day or so. So it's been phenomenal. And since we started from, from day one, Till now, we've done over about four hundred twenty odd thousand downloads just from wow. the podcast, and it's just been consistently growing. And every month, we've gone from forty to fifty downloads, and so like forty thousand to fifty thousand downloads. So it's been doing really well. You know, I'm very very happy that there's so so much traction and built a really strong community behind it, and a lot of loyal listeners. Congratulations on that. Have you figured out the amount of man hours that you're putting behind one podcast? <laughs> uh, well. I would probably say it takes about an hour to record with the guests, which is given. Uh -huh. It's probably take about another 15 minutes or so to record the narration and then maybe another 15 minutes or so to review it. So maybe an hour and a half, maximum two hours per episode to actually get it out the door because the rest of it, as I said, is all done my, by my team. So I just have to make sure it's all been approved and checked and so forth. But yeah, it's, I'd say about maximum two hours per episode. And then with your team, do you know the man hours that they're putting into each episode? Okay, so say, for example, if we were to look at maybe editing part one, because we mm -hmm. split them into two parts, uh, usually part one takes about half a day or so, so maybe at least four hours for them to edit. Then the editor takes about two hours to edit one, so it's about six hours there. Yeah, it's, it's quite a lot of man hours, actually, now you think about it. And then all the publishing and editing, maybe another hour on top, so all up maybe about seven hours per episode from, from that side of the business. Yeah. It, it, most people don't know that because, you know, they think, oh, yeah. podcast. Oh, you know, Tyrone got ranked really quickly, really fast. Let me, I want to do it too. And I found that people that start, you know, have that motivation, they start podcasting. They really don't make it past 30 episodes or so because they realize the man hours that are part of podcasting. And, um, yeah. yeah, I had a friend reach out the other day and he was asking, yeah, think about starting a podcast. I'm like, the first thing you need to know before you do anything is that it's a, it's, it's like tackling another business. Like you're, you're, yep. you're starting a new business or another product and that's what you're going to launch and you're going to spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, and I'm curious too, if you know the roughly, if you, if you're open to share the cost per episode that you spend per spend on a podcast episode oh, to be honest chris i haven't even sat down and, and worked that out so i wouldn't be able to share that with you okay. um, yeah it, it's very hard because what the 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 time because i'm very fortunate i've been able to find interns who um are happy to do this you know on a free basis because they're getting the experience whilst i'm giving them the yeah, they're getting the experience from me whilst they're also getting the knowledge as well. So I've mm. been very unfortunate that everything I've been doing has not really costed anything to the business except time. So I guess the only thing I can say is the time that's been totaled up, if you add that all up, is what I can really tell you. Here's a, here's a great question. Where do you find the interns at? From, I think it was Entreport. They were running an internship program 
previously, and they share with me how they get actually interns to help them run their CRM system and, and do all sorts of things. And I thought, oh, hold on, I could do that. So I, I started that maybe about four years ago um, with an internship program. And all I did was just basically put together an ad of what I was looking for. I, I knew that interns, or I knew certain markets like marketing and journalism and video production, they require a lot of experience to get into that if you want to get a full-time pay role. Oh, so wow. I thought, you know, leverage off that knowledge and offer experience for, you know, for, for unpaid internship to these people. And basically, I just posted it on pedestrian.tv, indeed.com, pretty much the, 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 the sites that allow you to post for free, you know, job ads. And I've just been getting a lot of candidates coming through there locally, and they've been more than happy to, to take this on. And they know in return, because the internship that I've put together, as, as I've developed over the last four years, they're pretty much going to get a job after this. And I can say confidently, 100% of all my interns, which I've had a lot of them, have all got jobs after this. So, oh, wow. You know, yeah, it's, it's been great. And that's why I think it's been a really rewarding experience to have them on board. And also on top of that, for me to you know, get a whole lot of things done. How long do they usually stay with you? When, um, 12, when, 12 months? 12 months, okay. yeah, and two days a week. I think I'm going to test that out. So I might ask some more questions later after sure. the show about I've, I've had in, in two kind of two interns before, like a month long volunteer for an event we did down in Thailand, which turned out to be a phenomenal experience. And then another intern that we used for like six months and it was an okay experience. But when you set up your internships, how, what are some things that you do? So they know it's a good quality internship. So for me, the most important thing at the beginning is to interview them and then send a test across because at the end of the day, you've got to hire good people. And I've been through some not so good interns and I've been through with some amazing interns. And I guess the difference between the two is when you actually do a test and ensure that they come for an interview and you ask the right questions, that you'll be able to determine from that point. And it's like with anything, if you're doing any... Um, coaching or mentoring, you'll probably want to have a checklist to make sure that these people meet certain criteria before you allow them into the coaching program. Otherwise, it's like with any customer. If you just work with any customer, some could be tie kickers, some could be really good customers. And if you don't have those filters or criteria in place, you may be wasting a lot of time. It's a, it, for me, it's the same thing. I, I have a checklist and I, I ask specific questions and I test them by sending them a, a sample test, whether it be like writing or editing one of my um, scripts, or, or for digital marketing, testing on how their, their literacy is and so forth like that. And that's how I'm able to find some really good interns. And then from there, I make it very clear with setting some expectations. These are the days of work, these are hours. This is the kind of training I'll be providing for you. And this is the system you would be working with. And most of the time, you know, they're all pretty much conform to all that and they're more than happy. And once they've got that routine in place, it's pretty much almost like as though they're working for me um, like an employee and I've got 12 months to work with them. So the longer wow. the interns, the better. I'll, I'll, I'll say that because I've run short interns and it, it happens too fast and a lot of them say to me, oh, could we stay for longer? I'm like, yeah, of course you can <laughs> <laughs> um, because they've just started and, and once they've just learned something, they don't want to leave. They want to keep going and apply and all that. So I just made a decision to make the internship 12 months and even then I've had a few of them said to me, oh, can I extend it for another six months? I'm like, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> It must be something I'm doing right that they really want to stay. So it, it's been phenomenal. And I mean, at one time, for example, right now in, in property investor, I have uh, four interns running with me. And so I pretty much have an intern covering every day of the week. And they're all basically all remote, right? Or do you, yeah. you, you don't yeah, have that? All school. remote. I catch up with them once a month. And yeah, we have a nice lunch and, and just have a bit of coaching and mentoring. But Besides that, you know, the rest of the time they're happy to go off and do what they need to do. You know, say an intern does really well, do you ever give them a bonus or financial incentive or anything? Yeah, I, I've made a decision not to. The okay. only thing I would give them is maybe a gift or take them out to lunch. Okay. Um, the reason why I don't give financial is because it sets that expectation and then that means then they would expect that as well. So for any unpaid internship, this is what I, I recommend to anyone who looks at internships is to Give it not in a monetary value, but in some form of a, you know, either lunch or, or a small gift or something like that. So therefore, there's no monetary value tied towards it. 
Wow. And no, it keeps, keeps it clean, keeps it really clean. So you don't yeah. have that issue. That's amazing. That is genius. Um, thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Let's talk more about uh, growing your podcast. So I think you mentioned you're around 400, did you say 420, 420,000 plus? Yeah. Yeah. And, and right now I think you're around 40,000 downloads per month. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes, minimum. In your mind, say, I've gotten different answers uh, from different podcasters. In your mind, what's the difference between a download and a listen or a play? Uh, hmm. To be honest, I don't think there is really any difference. Um, if somebody's, um, but when, whenever you press play on your episode, it is downloading an, an episode for you. So that's considered a play slash download plus listen. Um, now, the question is whether or not they listen the whole episode, the full way, is is a big question mark. But the good thing about Apple iTunes now is that they have stats in there that tell you how long people are actually listening to your podcast, where they're listening from, and also the devices that they're using. Because this was only released back in, if I remember correctly, it was early this year, around yeah. February, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. They released all that stats inside iTunes. And I, I've been monitoring that. and. I've been, you know, fortunate to say and very proud to say that pretty much most of my guests listen all the way to about 90, 85 to 90 percent of the episode. And the reason why I know that uh, they, they drop up at the 90 percent mark is because I have a call to action and also some kind of sponsorship <laughs> at, at the end. So that that's pretty normal. Um, so I know that, and that means that they are listening to the whole episode all the way down to the end. So that's been really good to know. So I just continue to do what I'm doing. Where is the majority of your listeners, the platform and the location coming from? So the platform is majority iTunes. Um, there is a little bit coming from Android. I'd say probably, if I'm not, if I remember correctly, I'm getting about say 80, 80 to about eighty five percent from iTunes, and then the remainder is just from all sorts of um, different you know platforms like Android, Overtures, etc. Um, and then in terms of location, yeah, I'd have to say pretty much 90, 95% is from Australia because it is an Australian property podcast. And um, I mean, it's funny because I do get some from overseas and uh, I have had probably a few people from the UK contact me and say, hey, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about it? And I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. It must be a similar market there for them to, to be listening. But they said that it's, it's, they just asked a few questions and I'm more than happy to answer them. But yeah, I, as I say, most of the listeners are usually Australian, and that's what usually we deal in because most of the guests are from Australia as well. And and I like to know your viewpoint on this. Do you think there there will be? I think eventually there will be, but you know, iTunes dominating the market now. Obviously, in your eyes, are there any future competitors or platforms that would are coming up that could even touch what iTunes has for pod, the podcasting world? Hard to say. I'll, I'll, I have recently seen Google Play bring out podcasting in their mm -hmm. platform, and I was keen to have a look, and I, I've actually been listed on there as well too. But it, it, depending, on, depending on how how easy they can break into that market to take share is going to be a challenge. It's like with the iPhone. When Steve Jobs released the iPhone and iPad, they were miles ahead of the competition when they first released it. And mm -hmm. since then, Samsung, for example, has been trying to catch up and still is, is you know, head to head with, with um, doing the competition. But you can still tell that iPhone is still in front because it's easy to use, it's, it's simple, it's an ecosystem that people love. And they've got a, a strong following. So I, I'd say unless Google came out with something similar to, to really um, create that fan base for people to switch over to Google Play, I think iTunes will still continue to dominate, which it has been for many, many years. And it's been like that in front for, for so many I think it'd have to be a complete revolution for some other platform to take over, like a Facebook or something. Do you have any any good iTunes hacks? <laughs> uh, a little tip, and this is, this is how I was able to rank up very quickly. It's going back to the good cowboy days with um, SEO, like back in Google days when you could actually just type in a keyword at the top of your page and put it on your, your post and all rank very very fast when there weren't that many people doing SEO. The same thing currently applies, and this is a little hack for everyone. I don't know how long it lasts for. Is that you <laughs> could just update some of your episodes and just put one keyword that you want to do, and you could change as many episodes as you want with that. And when you do a search, more than likely you'll rank for that. So 
the reason why I've been able to rank, for example, the property very well is one of my keywords on the episodes have been just changed to property. And um, when you search for that, you'll actually should be able to find it at the top of the search. Interesting. That's a good one. So, okay, I was thinking of good keywords for a business podcast. Business, obviously. Well, the, yeah, I, business, coaching. <laughs> coaching. Now, one of the things that I found, and I think you mentioned this too on your interview with James, is that uh, for me, podcasting has been an amazing and, and probably one of the best networking opportunities to connect with people that I never, ever, ever really had the opportunity to. And I, I love this story because I reached out to, have you ever heard of the Squatty Potty? Do you guys have that in Australia? No, what is that? You have to tell me. <laughs> the Squatty Potty is is a stool that, that, that fits under your toilet and it helps you, people that have challenges going number two, it helps them put their feet up so it, it releases the pressure on their pressure on their colon so they can go easier and the founder is a guy named bobby edwards and his mom was having this problem and his mom you know so he made a stool for his mom and then his mom shared it with her girlfriends and then their girlfriends and then their girlfriends and all of a sudden you know friends of friends and and the next thing you know this thing really exploded in america and i i recommend checking out it from a marketing standpoint they did an amazing you're into youtube they did an amazing youtube video for squatty potty and um it went viral i got like 150 million download or views and wow. yeah and so i reached out to him just cold email and I said, hey, I'm, I'm on a podcast and I'd like to interview Bobby. You know, I reached out to the team. And a few days later, I got an email back. I said, yeah, Bobby would love to come on the show. So then he, he calls right after he got off The View in America, which is a – it's probably one of the most famous. Yes, I heard, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about the famous, it's amazing. Yeah, women's talk show. And he called right after he got off that, and he, and he was on the podcast. And literally at this time, my girlfriend has a business down in Rio de Janeiro, and it's a co-working space in a Portuguese language school. And I was sitting outside in this little alley doing this podcast when because I couldn't record in her school at the moment because it was it would be too loud. And I was sitting in this little alley with noise and like a church bell in the background. And here's Bobby Edwards, the founder of a $35 million company, Squatty Potty Company, that's massively huge on in the in America. And he's on the he's on the show with me just because I have this platform that I that I set up that's that's called a podcast. Long story short, like it's. Uh, and it's been a massive for for networking for me and the opportunities have really opened up business wise and it kind of puts us on a little platform because people are, are like oh that's the host of this podcast show and so i'm curious about your experience using this as a networking channel to to grow contacts in business yeah i i totally totally agree with that it's it's very common. Once you start podcasting, opportunities open up left, right, and center. And I've experienced that already many, many times over. It was just interesting. The other day, one of my colleagues uh, emailed me and said, hey, you know, um, just wanted to let you know your podcast is doing really well. I had my electrician mention that he's been inspired to get into property. And I've never, ever <laughs> met this electrician before. I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> this is just like out of the blue. I've had people also contact me and say, hey, you know, so-and-so, I heard about you. Actually, this this is another cool true story. One of the guests who I recently got on the podcast and interviewed, she just mentioned to me, by the way, one of my girlfriends was saying she's been listening to the Property Investory podcast and recommended me to go onto it. I'm like, <laughs> 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 and she said, well, this is really good timing because you reached out to me and I said, of course I will. So it's just <laughs> bizarre. Like it, it opens up doors and I think the more people we impact, the more um, this platform just goes viral. Yeah. And what's really interesting is podcasting has been around for a while now. And I know in the States it's continuously growing. In Australia it is too. But it is still early adopters coming into it. Like I was just speaking to people doing sponsorship for my podcast and they were saying that a lot of people, small businesses and, and medium-sized businesses still haven't caught on to the fact that podcasting is a great medium for advertising. So only the big companies who understand it actually invest into it. Mm -hmm. So imagine what's happening right now as the revolution is changing, moving from possibly radio across to podcasting, sponsors are going to jump in eventually down the track. So if you set your podcast up now, which is 2018, you still have a long, long time to, to potentially grow that audience and capture it. And the reason why 
I believe I've been successful with this particular podcast is because I've stood out from the crowd from just the two or three podcasting, property podcasting, specifically in general, this is my niche, to stand out and just step up above it and, and go beyond what the other ones are doing right now. And that's why it's ranked up so fast and, and got a massive listenership because of that. So if you're in a niche that is currently not um, maybe even internet marketing related or, or finance related, you still have a huge opportunity to jump in because not many people are doing it. Mm -hmm. It's very true. What do you think are the importance? I know you have a lot of rates and reviews. What do you think are the importance of, of rates and reviews on iTunes these days? Definitely helps. Um, I've noticed personally when I, when I watch more reviews come through and, and consistently come through, the rankings do move up. But I think from what I've read as well, and, and you don't quote me on this, but you need to ensure that people are subscribing and also leaving a review as well in order to push rankings up. So I noticed when I was, I was getting a spike of rankings up higher because I got into the top 20 for business um, of, well, probably about a month or two ago. Um, it was because I was noticing my, my reviews were going up and also subscribers were going up. So it does have an effect, but nothing beats having a loyal listener constantly come back and download because Mm -hmm. What I've noticed is when I watch the trend of, of people listening to my podcast, it just consistently, I'm not going to say it's exponentially growing, it's consistently organically growing up. And what that means is my following is just gradually building one by one. I'm not you know, jumping from, say, um, 1,000 to, to 20,000 in one month. It's more like consistent growth from like 10,000, 15, 20, 25, etc. And that's, that's organic and that's what you want to see because that's when you build more loyal followers whereas the people who have built in from zero to a hundred thousand downloads in one month and then next month they have fifty thousand you're not really building a, a following you're, you're just building a very big spike in um, you know downloads so yeah. you know now i've done it for 12 months i have seen a consistency and i now know who are my loyal listeners and just from feedback from people emailing me and people telling me and you know referrals and referrals i know that the podcast is, is helping a lot of people out there as well too what do you think about publishing daily versus publishing weekly? Oh, it definitely makes a difference. Um, I have tried publishing three times a week and the downloads I was getting wasn't as much as I was getting it daily. So I personally, um, to keep it up, it, it is good to do it daily. Um, it is a lot of work, but it is worthwhile because I know that what, what's happening right now with the, the growth of it, the more you publish, the more consistency you have in, the more um, traction you'll gain. And that's why I can see there's been a snowball effect because I've been publishing daily. And um, I know you have two popular YouTube channels. And how do you think, uh, has podcasting helped boost any of your YouTube subscribers? Hard to say. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't focus too much on YouTube nowadays. I used to because I was promoting a lot about YouTube videos and, and video marketing and so forth. But I use currently YouTube at the moment to leverage off and, and spread in different medium. So I, I have what we call a, um, a repurposing type of content strategy behind this. And every time a podcast goes out, it automatically publishes to YouTube and publishes to all various different platforms. So I use that just to transfer the podcast into a different medium because some people prefer to listen on, on the go, on the audio like a podcast. Some people don't mind actually watching TV and, and see it on YouTube. Others might prefer to read a transcript, you know. So I, I try to provide all, for all three mediums. Makes sense. And uh, I think we'll do one last question, Tyrone. What do you think the future of podcast look like? podcasting looks like? Huge. Um, enormous, enormous potential because I have been listening to podcasts for probably a few years now. You know, when I first started, a lot of people didn't know much about it. And they were saying, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's good on, get to get things on demand. As I'm seeing more and more podcasts come on board, especially the big brands are now coming on board to set up their own podcasts, mm -hmm. I'm noticing that it is getting, um, what's the word for it, growing exponentially, especially in the even the property space. Uh, <laughs> 12 months ago, there was only probably about seriously five podcasts that were doing you know up, up in ranking. Now it's doubled up to 10 that mm -hmm. I, I've seen that are new. So there's been five new pod, podcasts that have come on board since you know I've been in the market. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it's just continuously growing, which means that there is still a lot of market share to, to be gained. And I, I don't think this will ever stop because just like the advent of Netflix, you know, Netflix, in my personal opinion, has taken over a lot of hiring, 
downloading of movies from um, or even just going to the video shop. I don't even know if those DVD shops even exist anymore. <laughs> I saw one the other day. I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even even like blockbusters and, and Video Easy in Australia has all closed down. Yeah. And um, so basically what I'm saying is what I, I, I will probably see is that podcast eventually not necessarily will replace radio, but it will probably be a medium that people will, will lean towards over radio instead mm -hmm. to access content because if you can get stuff on demand instead of having to listen to ads and so forth on the radio while driving home, you know, I'll do that any day. And at least I li listen to the things that I'm interested in rather than listen to the radio of, of people just talking about random stuff. Yeah. My my dad, um, he's retired and so he listens to the radio talk shows all day long while he reads the newspaper and, and plays Sudoku. And I, I'm pretty sure, I'm just <clears throat> guessing that when we're retired, if we ever retire, uh, we're going to be like that, Be li but it's going to be listening <laughs> to podcasts, right? We won't be listening to talk yeah. radio all day long. It'll be, be podcasts. And I think... Yeah, the radio world has got uh, got a got a huge competitor, um, without yeah, a doubt. Well, like big 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 stations like NPR and, and so forth and WYNC, they've all all embraced podcasting. Yes. And that's the reason why they've added that as the extra channel. And I know for a fact that they're moving more more into that, but they still have their physical stations which they still need to maintain. But it's just another way for them to leverage. And like for example, Freakonomics, I know that they're generating like six million downloads a, a month. And if you combine everything that they do within NPR and, and the whole station across the different podcasts, they're doing hundreds of, I think it's like over 100 million downloads a month across <laughs> all their podcasts. Wow. So they, they know the value of that and they're not going to stop. What, uh, what are some of your favorite podcasts, Tyrone? Um, I, I kind of have mentioned it. Freakonomics, yeah. uh, How I Built This, they're, they're two of my favorite podcasts I listen to. I'm actually just opening up my podcast app just to double check if there's anything else that I listen to a lot yeah it's mostly those two uh, masters of scale with reed hoffman hoffman i just wish you'd get more uh, release more episodes but that was one of my favorite podcasts as well and another one lead to win with michael hyatt that sounds good all right so we're going to wrap up there tyrone i want to give you a huge thank you for coming on the show thank you so much for sharing all your podcast wisdom we really really appreciate it and uh, all of your tools and tactics so thank you so much you're welcome, Chris. It was a pleasure to come into the show. And hopefully all the listeners gained some really good insight into this. And hopefully it, it will help them with anything that they do with regards to podcasting. If the listeners want to reach out and learn more besides going to, the, to your podcast, is there any other ways that they could find you on social media or any contact information? Sure. So if they want to visit the website at Property Investory, so it's basically the word Property Investor with a Y dot com. You'll be able to see all the information there, podcasts, social media, pretty much everything if you want to reach out to me. You can even contact me directly there as well too. Excellent. And we're going to wrap up there. Listeners, we want to say thank you for coming in and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.